again, I would like to uh, echo the comments that Rob made as we are introducing the lectureship this week. We have some that are visiting uh, from other areas, um, some uh, who I've met, some I haven't yet, but uh, I know at least uh, some that I've talked to have found out about uh, this lectureship on Facebook through the invitations that we created, which is a good thing to know that that's an effective tool. And so we're just excited to have everybody here tonight and uh, we hope that our study together is, is gonna be beneficial. Before we get started tonight, I just wanna, I guess by way of introduction, say that uh, this series of topics that uh, Paul and Rob and I settled on, the series of lessons was a direct result of some feedback that we received from everybody uh, from that survey that we took, we did several months ago, I guess the beginning of the year. And uh, some of that feedback was that you like to, there was a desire to hear some, just some practical life lessons. And so this is a direct result of that. Uh, now, we, we chose six topics and, and we know that there's a lot more that can be said and uh, that's still being discussed that we may decide to continue that later on next year, yet to be decided. Um, but uh, uh, this is where we are for, for this series, and, and again, this is, uh, I guess, as a result of, of feedback and, and requests from all of you. So uh, we hope that everybody will dive in, and we hope that this will be a beneficial study. I, I think it will be. I've uh, been kind of looking forward to it. When you think about uh, the word mediocre or mediocrity, it's defined as uh, a moderate quality, um, means it's not very good. Um, some synonyms that uh, come to mind would be things like ordinary or average or middle of the road or uninspired or run of the mill or fill in the blank, right? Maybe lackluster, uninspired, there's several words that come to mind when you think about this idea of mediocrity. And I guess I wanted to start tonight by thinking about it in terms of restaurant service. <laughs> when, uh, uh, I guess the question is, what experiences do we remember the most? And really we have kind of two ends of the spectrum that I think are memorable. We have the, 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 the bad end, right, where uh, your experience with service is not very good at all. And um, we don't forget that. When we have a bad experience, it just doesn't leave our mind, does it? And uh, we probably will tell other people about our experience, our bad experience, and it will more than likely affect uh, our decision to go back to that restaurant uh, when we receive really poor service. We remember that. On the other end of the spectrum, when our service is above and beyond, when it is just outstanding, excellent service, we're very well taken care of, we remember that too. And as a result of that, we probably will tip a little bit more than we normally would, and uh, again, will affect our decision on whether we decide to go back to that restaurant or not. Uh, we'll probably will go back because the service was really good. And so we have kind of both ends of the spectrum, that are memorable, uh, either good or bad, right? But it's the stuff in the middle that when it's just ordinary, when it's just average, when it's just mediocre service, not great, not poor, then that stuff there in the middle, it's not memorable. It's not memorable. It doesn't really stick with us. Uh, we don't really notice it. Um, it's just kind of blah, right? It's just kind of bland. Uh, there's just nothing, nothing to it. And so we can, we think about this, we could probably relate to uh, this idea to, to other areas of life besides just restaurant service. Um, but it seems to me anyway that customer service is just not what it used to be. Maybe some of you would agree with that or I don't know, but uh, it just seems like it's just not what it used to be. And uh, I, I think that, uh, it seems to me anyway, for the most part, uh, this is kind of painting with a broad brush, but um, service in our society, not just restaurant service, but service in general, could be described as mediocre. 
um, nowadays. And I think it's probably a fair statement, maybe this is a little bit of a stretch, but I think it's a fair statement to say that our society in general is mediocre, that society is kind of just content with the status quo, just kind of satisfied with the status quo, not really striving to be excellent in things. And so there was someone that once said that the greatest waste of our natural resources is the number of people who never reach their potential. Why don't you think about that for a moment? Greatest waste of natural resources is the number of people who never reach their potential. And so I want to consider that statement and this idea in a spiritual context tonight. And I think that this person has a pretty good grasp on a serious problem for a lot of Christians and unfortunately maybe even for a lot of churches. For those of us in Christ, we understand that we have a great potential for spiritual success. And this lesson serves as sort of an introduction to this series of lessons. And so I want to begin tonight with some self-evaluation. I think that's a real important start for what we want to talk about tonight, as well as a lead into the other topics that we're going to be discussing in the series. So let's begin with some self-evaluation. I want each of you to consider for a moment, and obviously don't verbalize this, but, but I want you to consider for a moment your level of knowledge, your level of service. As you evaluate yourself, think about your level of purity, of dedication, of devotion, of leadership, or any other quality that you might be thinking of. I want you to just evaluate yourself for a moment and think about your level. And ask yourself this follow-up question, and that is, are you truly meeting your potential? And if not, why not? Right? Those are important questions as we introduce this lesson. Would you describe yourself in all of those aspects that we just mentioned? Would you describe yourselves as, as mediocre or average or ordinary um, or perhaps satisfied with the status quo, just, just kind of average? Is that how you would describe yourself? And if so, I want you to remind yourself of what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 16. If I remember right, I think Rob covered this in the series last lectureship, which, believe it or not, was a year ago, uh, when we were talking about uh, all of what was said to the churches in Asia in Revelation. And what is said there to the church at Laodicea is what? You're lukewarm. And God's attitude, Jesus' his attitude is, I want to spew you out of my mouth. And so when we're reminded of that, we certainly don't want to be judged in that way. And so... When you think about the self-evaluation and the questions that I just posed for you, if you find yourself lacking, then ask yourself, why aren't you excelling as a Christian? What's holding you back? What is preventing you from rising above mediocrity? I want to start out tonight with identifying the problem. I think that's where a good place to start. What is the root of sin, the problem of sin, and what is the root of this spiritual mediocrity. And I want to begin by saying, first of all, that we have to acknowledge that there is, in fact, a spiritual war that is going on. There's a spiritual war that is going on for our minds. And I want you to turn to James chapter 1, because I want to read these verses that may be familiar to us, um, but I think that this is a good place to start. In James chapter 1, look at verse 13 through 15. He says, let no one say when he is tempted that I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. These verses are telling us that sin starts in our minds. And our minds have evil desires that produce sin. And so if we're stuck in mediocrity, what it really means is, is that the desires of our flesh are winning over the desire for a closeness to God and spiritual success. That's really what it means. 
But you know what else is interesting about these verses? What else I think is significant? It teaches us in these verses, again, pretty familiar verses to us. But it teaches us right away, if you look at them and think about them, that the problem of sin and this, this spiritual mediocrity, this problem, is not outside of us. We, the problem is not God. The problem is not any other outside factors like family or friends or our, our life circumstances that we may find ourselves in or uh, our job or the economy or anything else. We, we can't blame anything else. We can't blame our mediocrity on anything else. The source of the problem is always, always right here. The source of the problem is always our desires because something inside of us tells us and encourages us to do certain things. And so what we know from these verses, and this is what I think is significant that we need to think about, what we know from these verses is, is that we have total control over this problem. We can fix things if there's issues, and that's encouraging. It's really kind of simple if you think about it. I want to put it just, I guess this is the best analogy I can think of, but uh, it's really simple when you think about it. But let me ask you a real simple question. Why, why do fish get caught? Why do fish get caught? <laughs> no, not that's why. Boy. But it's because of the bait on the hooks, is it not? It's because of the bait on the hooks, they, they desire worms. And so I can assure you that if you were to go and put a piece of broccoli on a hook and go fishing, you're going to have a very long, disappointing day. But it's because of the desire for the worms, or whatever you use, let's just say worms. It's, the, it's because of the desire for the worms that rules their minds and it outweighs the fear that they bite. And the same is true with us. The same is true with us. We stay stuck in sin, and we stay, st we stay stuck in this, this rut of mediocrity because our desires are overcoming our minds. And at the end of the day, the reason that we may not be serving others, that we may not be praying as often as we should and as sincerely as we should, the reason that we're not studying more, not diving into God's Word, and not meditating on His Word, or not coming together and meeting whenever the church comes together to meet, whatever the case may be, the reason we're not doing those things is actually very, very simple. It's because we have desires that are greater than our desire for these spiritual activities. That's just as plain as I know to put it. And secondly, as we think about identifying the problem, we need to acknowledge our enemy. We also need to recognize that Satan is going to work harder than anyone you have ever known to tempt you in every way possible. Satan is going to explore your weaknesses and your desires so that you will remain distracted. That's what he wants. That's what he's going to do. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, tells us here in this verse that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's what it is. That's our struggle. That's the battle. And in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, and again, another very familiar passage to us, tells us and names Satan that he is our enemy. Very clearly stated, he is our enemy, he is our adversary, and he is compared to a lion that is just constantly seeking new prey. That's what he does. And so Satan is always, let this sink in, he is always scheming and seeking to spark more desires in our heart. And you know what? He's been doing this as a full-time job since Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. He hasn't stopped. And he's going to target you. And so when you think about it in this context of our discussion, if your struggle is materialism, guess what? He's going to provide an opportunity. He's going to provide it through sales and advertisement and the pressure to 
keep up with the, the, the neighbors and all of that, right? That he's, he's going to present opportunities. That's just the way it's going to be. The same thing can be said about lust. If that's your struggle, if that's the struggle and the desire that you have in your heart and your mind, if that's the struggle, then again, Satan is going to provide opportunities. He's going to provide opportunities through immodest dress. He's going to provide opportunities through movies or TV shows or whatever the case may be. He's going to do that because he's good at his job. What we need to understand and accept is that he is always active and he is always looking for a way to use your weakness as his greatest strength. He is always going to make sin look good. He is always going to make it look attractive because, again, he knows that that will distract us from a desire to serve God. And thirdly, as we think about this idea of just kind of identifying the problem, we have to ask ourselves, well, with all this being said, well, what do we do? What do we do? I'm going to suggest to you that what we need to do is that we need to take the fight to him. And we need to just declare all-out war to the evil that is compromising our minds. And I want you to think about this idea for just a second. What is it that you struggle with? What is... What is the root desires behind all of those struggles that you have? Your personal struggles, my personal struggles. What are those root desires? What's behind all of that? What, what, what desires are keeping you in, in restrained into this, this, this rut of mediocrity, this spiritual mediocrity? What's holding you back? Now, as we think about that, don't discourage yourself by creating some big long laundry list and thinking, wow, I've just got a lot of work to do. And that's fine if you do. But let's not get discouraged by just looking at this massive list. But for now, I want you just to consider one or two things. One or two things that we can focus on that are holding you back in spiritual mediocrity. And while you're thinking about that, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 12. What are these things that are holding you back? What's behind all of these desires? Think about that as we read. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I think this is a good place that has a good answer for overcoming these desires. Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And notice what he says in verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of, the God, of will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now let me ask you before we dig into this, these two verses, let me ask you, just by reading those two verses, do you get the impression at all that God wants you to live an average, mediocre life? Is that what the takeaway is from those two verses when you read that? I, I don't think so at all. Not at all. But first, Paul warns them. He says, don't be conformed to this world. Don't take the shape of the world that you live in. Don't allow the world to mold you into something that you don't need to be. Don't be conformed. But he's also telling us something very interesting. And we always focus on that aspect of it, but think about this as well. What he's really saying is, is he's telling us that, again, in the context of our discussion, he's telling us that the desires of our minds that we're talking about, guess what? Those things can be taught. They can be taught to us by the actions and the mindsets of the worldly people and influences around us. He's saying, don't allow that to happen. Don't be conformed to the world. So these desires that we're talking about, guess what? Again, we said a while ago, these are in our control, right? We can fix these things. Here's verses, and Paul is telling them there, don't be conformed, because these things can be taught, which means we can control this. We can change this. So that should be an encouragement to us. And so as we think about our struggles, and what in... What influences exist that are reinforcing those desires, as I asked a minute ago? Is it the people that you're around? 
Is it our friends? Is it shows that we watch? Uh, is it music that we listen to? Is it things that we read? I, I don't know. What, what is it? You have to ask yourself and answer that for yourself. But the point is, is that if we will just stop and think about those things, and if we'll take note of those things, then we can know what we need to change. We know that these things are influencing us. We know that these things are reinforcing these desires internally. And when we can take note of those, then we know what we can remove. We can remove those influences within us. And again, we take control of the fight. We take the war to Satan. Instead of sitting back and allowing him to attack us, we take it to him. And we start taking control. But secondly, notice what Paul says in Romans chapter 12. He says that our minds need to be transformed. They need to be renewed. Now, what I'm about to say is probably the most obvious thing that I can state tonight. You ready for this? <laughs> but the only place that we can change our minds and our hearts and our desires for the better is where? It's in the Word of God. It's in the Word of God. Uh, again, told you it's not going to be some big, mirac you know, big revelation, right? We've heard that a million times, but let's think about it for a second. That's the only place that change is going to take place. I want you to think about this. When we find ourselves in the Word, and now what I mean by that is not, maybe not necessarily sitting down at a table with our Bibles open and reading, but when I mean in the Word, that could take a variety of forms, right? That could be I'm driving down the road and I'm meditating on a certain thought, or maybe it is that I'm reading, or maybe it's I'm listening to the audio Bible on my, you know, uh, the, the, the truck as I'm driving down the road, or uh, maybe it's I'm, I'm praying about a certain thing or whatever. But whatever the, point, whatever the form is, when I'm in the Word and whatever form that takes, guess what's not present? Sinful desires. Isn't that amazing? When I'm in the Word, those desires aren't there. But the second that I step outside of that realm, the second that I step outside of the Word, then we're opening ourselves up to the possibility. And so what I want to suggest to you tonight is that we become so familiar with Scripture that we internalize it, we absorb it, we just soak it in, and we allow it just to soak in our minds, and what we're doing is we're preparing ourselves for the fight. We're preparing ourselves for the fight that when the desires of our minds rise to the surface, then what we, we're ready to do is we're ready to respond, just like Jesus did when he was tempted by Satan in Matthew chapter 4. Every time Satan approached him, what was Jesus' response? It is written... Now, I'm not saying that we have to actually verbalize those words when things pop up. That's not my point. But the point is, is that he was prepared, and we need to be prepared. When those things rise up, we are thinking about these concepts. We're thinking about biblical principles. We're thinking about what God says on a certain matter, and we're fighting. And we're extinguishing those desires. We're prepared, again, bringing all-out war onto this. And so... Spiritual mediocrity, medio me, easy for me to say, spiritual mediocrity, <laughs> I knew I was going to do that at some point tonight, but spiritual mediocrity that plagues us, um, sometimes it, it starts with the desires that are in us. And so we have to realize that there is in fact a war that's raging for our minds. It is. We've got to know our enemy. We've got to know how he works. We've got to know how hard he is going to work. And we've got to be ready to be proactive and take the fight to him. So in the next section of this lesson, I, I, as we dig a little deeper here into this rising above mediocrity, I want to make some suggestions that I called the formula for success. Now, I, I, I'll admit to you, I had a really hard time. That's why I put it in quotes, because... That may not be the best title. I had a real hard time figuring out what I wanted to call this section of the lesson. So we'll just go with this, all right? You can criticize me later for it. But uh, let's think about some things. 
uh, uh, what I'll call a formula for success as we again consider how to rise above mediocrity. And the first thing I want to suggest to you is that we need to understand and we need to embrace, and I think that's the key word, we need to embrace our purpose. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, again, I, a lot of these verses tonight that I'm using are, are not um, unfamiliar to us, I don't think at all. They're verses that we refer to quite often. In First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, here's what it says. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What we understand from this verse is that as a child of God, we are one of God's chosen instruments. We are his mouthpiece. We are his instrument, his mouthpiece. We are a chosen people. We are God's own possession so that we may do what? Proclaim the excellencies of him. We have a great message to share. And we are special to him with a very special responsibility. And he is calling us again. Here's our subject of our lesson. But he is calling us to rise above average. To rise above average being mediocre. And so what I want to say to you very boldly is this. Do not let Satan drag you down into the mire of believing that you have nothing to offer God because that is just not true. That's one of, ways, one of the main ways that I think Satan works. Is he discourages Christians to think, well, I'm not good enough to do anything. I don't have anything to offer. And that's just not the case. Don't let him drag you down into that mire. Don't fall for it. We need to embrace who we are as children of God. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 tells us there that we are his workmanship. It says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. In other words, what he's saying is, is that we ought to be a fruit-bearing people. That we, we, we have so much to offer. Each one of us has, has certain unique talents and abilities. This congregation is full of unique things. And it's incredible just to sit back and observe. There are so many abilities here amongst every single member that is a part of this congregation. God has blessed us tremendously. Some translations in this verse right here, I actually kind of like the way it's stated, says, instead of uh, the way that I just read it, says that we are God's masterpiece. And I kind of like that because it says basically that you, as a child of God, makes you anything but average. Anything but average. You know what? There is no such thing as an average masterpiece. Did you know that? Anything but average. Titus chapter 3 and verse 14. Towards the end of this letter here. It says in the next to last verse. Our people must also learn to engage in good deeds. To meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. So in the context of this point right here. What I want to say is don't let fear. Don't let timidity. Don't. Don't let a lack of confidence or anything along those lines, don't let any of those things make you unfruitful. We need to remember, again, understand and embrace our purpose. We need to understand that God has created you for this purpose. And if he created you for this purpose, guess what? He is not going to leave you unprepared. He's not going to give you a job that you do not have the ability to do. It's just not. God has your back. Depend on Him. Turn to Him for guidance and for strength. Embrace your God-given uniqueness and His unconditional love for you. I ran across an illustration as I was thinking about this point. 
and I think it fits very fitting, actually. And it goes like this. There was one day, there was a small boy who was trying to lift a heavy stone, and he couldn't budge it. And his father was passing by and stopped to watch his efforts. And finally, he said to his son, Son, are, are you using all of your strength? Yes, I am, the boy cried, uh, exasperated. And the father says very calmly, No, you're not. You haven't asked me to help you. Now, what did that child need to learn? He needed to learn to depend on his father for an added source of strength. And the parallel is pretty obvious, isn't it? We need to depend on our Heavenly Father for an added source of strength. Life is tough sometimes. But He's there to help us. And He's promised us that He's going to help us if we just simply turn to Him. We need to make a clean break from our mediocre past. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 in verse 1. Paul here is encouraging them to cleanse themselves from all defilements of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness and the fear of God. What he's really telling them there is you need to get rid of the baggage. Get rid of the baggage. Let go of anything that causes you to be unclean. Ask yourself this. Are there things in your life? Make this very personal. Are there things in your life right now that are holding you back in an average existence? What are those things that we need to make a clean break from? So that we can really, truly move forward. I'm sure most of you have heard this, but you ever heard the definition of insanity? <laughs> it goes like this. If you continue to do the exact same thing over and over and over again, but yet you expect a different result, that's the definition of insanity. And that applies to our spiritual lives. As we think about it, as we're looking at this rising above mediocrity, if we really want to rise above mediocrity, then we need to be determined to make a clean break with the things that are holding us back. We need to know that you are today who you, here's the key word, you are today who you have decided to become. It's our choice. Remember, we've been emphasizing this the whole time. This is totally in our control. You are today who you have decided to become and that you can be more. You can. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Great passage. It actually follows a familiar passage in Hebrews chapter 11 where there is this list of all of these heroes of faith. And in Hebrews chapter 1, or excuse me, chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which easily entangles us. Why? So that we can run. So we can run this race that is before us. What he's saying is that we need, to, we need to strip ourselves of all of the things that make us mediocre so that we can excel and we can fulfill our purpose and we can run and just take off the way that he wants us to. And did you notice the first part of that verse, by the way? <laughs> we have kind of a crowd that's cheering us on. Let's not forget that. People that have already run the race. But I think it's also important as we think about this topic, I think it's also important that we have a sense of where we're going. May I suggest to you that 
I think part of this process of rising above spiritual mediocrity, we might need to set some small attainable goals for ourselves. Uh, we, we don't need to commit to this big drastic overnight change uh, again, with this long laundry list of perhaps things we need to fix, uh, again, those are, it's great. We, we're aware of those things. If you have multiple things, fantastic. We know we're aware of them. We'll work on them gradually. But as we think about this, we need to so let's set some smaller goals for ourselves, some attainable goals that will help us to, uh, to rise above mediocrity. And once we've accomplished these things, then, yeah, well, let's move on to some things that may be a bit more challenging and, and just make some progress. But the point is, is we need to have a vision. We need to have a plan. We need to have a sense of direction of what we're doing. Don't let fear and complacency and, and laziness or anything like that get you off track. Stick to the plan. Have this vision where we're going. Be determined to work and to push hard to achieve these goals. Let's focus all of our energy that we can as we think about this tonight in these next few lessons. Let's focus all of our energy into preparing to do something great with our spiritual lives. And remember this, that your past or your current circumstances do not have to limit your future. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, Paul tells them there, to be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, as we think about this, the church needs people to be above average. The body of Christ needs every member to do their part. We talked about this a few weeks ago, actually. We were looking at Ephesians chapter 4. It needs Christians that are going to carry their weight, so to speak. The church needs elders that are going to truly shepherd the flock. It needs deacons who are going to wholeheartedly and diligently serve. It needs a preacher who is going to truly minister to the congregation and the saints. It needs every single member to contribute and do whatever is necessary to the health and the growth of the body of Christ. That's what's needed. So we need to leave average behind. We need to seize new opportunities. And yes, this is closely related to the point we made just a second ago about making a clean break. But we need to be determined to leave mediocre behind. And we need to proactively reach forward, seizing new opportunities. Let's don't settle for hanging around people who, are, who are, think that being average and the status quo is, is the best that there is. We need to surround ourselves with people who are willing to serve the Lord with gladness, who want to rise above mediocrity themselves. Someone once said, the hardest struggle of all is to be something different from what the average man is. And so we need to ask ourselves, are my current friends, are my current inner circle, if you will, are they the kind that are going to encourage me on this new journey? Are they the kind of people that see difficulties in every opportunity? Or do they see opportunity in the difficulties of life? The truth is, is that sometimes we just need to change playgrounds and playmates. You ever heard that phrase before? Sometimes that's what we need to do. So are these people, are they going to encourage me to better myself? Uh, here's a good question. Do I have people around me that love me enough to hold me accountable and to help me? It's a really good question to ask. We need to seize opportunities. We need to stop waiting for a better time or better conditions. And as we said a minute ago, let's rely on God's power to take advantage of the opportunities that he gives you. We need to always be available for him to let him use us whenever and however he wants Pray to God, ask Him for the confidence that we need in order to believe that He has truly prepared you for every good work. Which means that we may have to step out of our comfort zone. But again, God's there to help us. Ephesians chapter 5, I want to read these verses as we start to wrap this up. Ephesians chapter 5, in, uh, I want you to look at verse 7 through 17. Paul says, therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, 
For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them, for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done to the, by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It seems pretty obvious to me that God doesn't want us to live an average existence. He doesn't want us to just be coasting through life, but rather we need to make the most of every chance that we get. And so I want to encourage you to leave average behind. Let's seize new opportunities to excel. And as we do that, make note of your progress along the way. Give yourself some credit. Maybe it means keeping a journal or whatever the case may be. That's fine. But let's make note of our progress along the way and the growth that takes place. And hopefully we'll be able to look back and we'll be able to see all of that significant progress in yourself. The last point is this. Don't settle for average. The truth is, and here's the hard truth to borrow Rob's phrase of a lesson that he's going to be preaching Sunday morning. Here's a hard truth. God doesn't want anything to do with average. He doesn't. We've already noted what is said in Revelation 3 and verse 16. But what we really need to understand, what we need to realize is, is that somebody that is average or somebody that is mediocre, somebody that's average, they are just as close to the bottom as they are the top. They're just right there in the middle. So being lukewarm, being average, being mediocre, it's a serious, serious business. And so if we find ourselves being more attentive to gym time or recreational activities or sporting events or hobbies or whatever the case is, if we find ourselves being more attentive to those things than we do to expanding the kingdom of God, then something's out of whack. Again, just another hard truth. We need to excel while we can. We need to realize that time is something that you never get back once you've spent it. And wasting time is in reality wasting your life. Don't waste it being mediocre. And in summary, our attitude needs to be this. Hard truth. <laughs> Wholehearted rejection of a mediocre spiritual life. Wholehearted. That's what God wants. If we had cancer, you'd want to get rid of it. If you had a bad heart or whatever, you'd want to fix it. Whatever the case is, right? We need to understand how displeasing mediocrity is to God. That's biblical. Don't settle for it in your life. And so the overall message is this tonight. Let's strive to be the best that we can be. Let's not settle for average. Let's not settle for mediocre. Let's strive for excellence uh, spiritually. We're going to be talking about some subjects these next few days that are going to be, some of them may be challenging. Um, and as we study each one of them, what I would ask of you is that we, we look at them and think about them and listen to what is said in the context of, of what we've discussed tonight. Tomorrow, when Rob speaks about bitterness and, and mistreatment and how, how that we handle that, let's think about how that we can excel in those areas. Uh, let's not be like the world and, and just be content with the status quo and react to those, those things like the world uh, and most people would, would react. The same thing can be said about contentment. Uh, I'm sure Paul's going to talk about you know, how does God view that subject and what is biblical contentment and, and all of those things. Uh, and how, the question is, how are we going to look at that from this point forward? Are we going to excel? Sunday morning when Rob asked the question, this, the, the hard truths, what makes hard truths so hard to say and so hard to hear? How are we going to handle that? What are we going to do with that? Are we going to strive for excellence or are we going to settle for mediocrity? And then the subject of sensualities. Oh, wow. Uh, are we going to just be like the average worldly person is? Or are we going to be different? 
Is our light going to shine brighter? Uh, hopefully this is going to be a beneficial study. I, I, th I think it will. I, I leave you with this challenge as we get ready to stand and sing this last song. I leave you with this challenge. I, I, I leave myself with this challenge. I, I, this is, in studying and preparing for this, this is very challenging to me as well. Uh, I leave you with this. As we leave this place tonight, as we walk through these doors in just a few minutes, as we leave here, are we going to strive to be better or are we simply going to settle for average? Are we just going to stay where we're at and be content with that or are we going to strive to do better? That's the real question. That's what we got to think about. That's the decision. Again, it's in our control. We have to make that decision and we can do that and we can be better. And I hope that we all will. If there's anything that we can help you with tonight in your spiritual life, let us know as we stand up and sing this last song.